Hey guys, it's Sandro here. In today's video is a full step-by-step -step car detail on this new Tesla Model 3, where I'll be preparing, correcting, and ceramic coating the paint for the owner. Now believe it or not, this is my first ever time detailing a Tesla, so I'm interested to see what the paint and finish of the car is like to work with. The owner took delivery of this car just a few weeks ago, apparently after waiting quite a few years for it to finally be available. So it seems like the demand for these cars far outweighs the supply. As with every car I ceramic coat, it will start with a full exterior surface cleanse and decontamination, and as it's a new car that shouldn't have more than very minor defects, it'll undergo a paint enhancement correction process to further extract and enhance the gloss and clarity of the paint, as well as prepare it for the Nova Pro coating that the owner has selected. Apart from that, the owner has also opted for a windscreen coating to protect the quite extensive amount of glass on the vehicle, but decided not to go for a wheel coating. Now as you can see, I'll be displaying some text on screen to give a little information as to the products I'm using for each step, and I'll also have them listed in the description box. And I'll do my best to try and explain each step and process as I go. I always start with the wheels as they're usually the dirtiest part of the car. But more importantly, it's because I don't want standing water on the car that'll dry and create water spots while I'm cleaning the wheels, and also because I don't want to clean the paint and then have that wheel grime dirtying the paint again. Now although I didn't realise it until I started cleaning the wheels, this car has plastic hubcaps or wheel covers rather than alloy rims. But I have to say that they're the nicest looking wheel covers I've ever seen, and without getting too close up, they really do look like a nice set of alloy rims. And although the customer hasn't opted to ceramic coat them, they'll still get a proper thorough clean and I'll still be putting a sealant on them to help protect and maintain them. To clean the tyres and wheel wells, I generally use some slightly stiffer nylon brushes with an all-purpose cleaner or degreaser, as they're far more capable at cleaning and stripping down those surfaces than a dedicated wheel cleaner. But for the actual rims, or wheel caps in this case, I use a dedicated wheel cleaner as they're far more effective at tackling brake dust and wheel grime compared to an all-purpose cleaner. And I use softer and safer wheel woolly brushes, feathered nylon brushes and microfiber wash mitts to safely remove all that grime. My first step with the body of the car is a pre-soak foam, and I'm using a more capable, just slightly off pH balanced car wash detergent that's going to have an increased cleaning and stripping ability over a general maintenance car wash soap, yet still be completely safe on all the surfaces and have that same fantastic lubrication. After allowing the snow foam a good 5-10 to 10 minutes to start softening the surface grime, I'll give the entire surface of the car a very thorough pressure rinse down that's going to remove the vast majority of the dirt and surface grime in a completely safe and touchless method. And I'll just add that water is primarily a solvent, so allowing it to firstly sit on the car together with the snow foam is what starts to break down and soften that surface contamination. And during this whole wash and decontamination process, the car will continue to stay wet and the water and chemicals will continue to soften, break down and strip off all that grime and any existing waxes or sealants. You can think of it like soaking a dirty cooking pot in water for an hour or so. It just makes cleaning it so much easier as the water and dish soap safely and effectively breaks down that baked on grime 
without having to aggressively scrub and scratch it. For the hand wash stage, I'm using the very same strip car wash detergent in my bucket for increased cleaning and stripping abilities, and I'm basically working from the top to the bottom of the car using next to no pressure in a section by section manner and rinsing out my wash mitt after each section to minimise any potential swirls or scratches. In essence, it's the dirt or grime that you're lifting off the car and onto your wash mitt that's going to cause swirls. So whether you're using a two bucket wash method or you're using your hose to rinse off the mitt or using multiple clean wash mitts, what really matters is that your wash mitt is clean or rinsed out frequently throughout the hand wash stage. And I hate the fact that some people say that it doesn't matter if you scratch the paint if you're going to polish it afterwards or it doesn't matter if the paint's already badly scratched. It does matter guys, existing deeper scratches get even deeper when you put smaller scratches into them. And even on a new car like this, I've seen so many brand new cars that have been absolutely hacked by broom brushes and terrible car washing methods, which meant that I had to remove a lot more clear coat than I should have. And you need to understand that once that clear coat's gone, it's gone for good. So regardless of whether the paint is already scratched up, and regardless of whether you're going to polish the paint or not, unsafe washing methods destroy clear coat. End of story. After giving the car another pressure rinse down, this is a stage where I really start to have a look at how the water is behaving on the paint. Is it beating up and sheeting off the paint quickly, meaning that there's still an existing wax or sealant that needs to be further stripped off? Or is the water quite flat and pooling with very slow sheeting, meaning that there's no signs of any existing paint protection, which is my goal. 
I'm then filling the paint to assess whether there is a level of environmental fallout or iron particles that need to be addressed. And lastly, I'm also looking at the paint to discover whether there's any existing contamination such as rotar, bug splatter, bird poo and so on that the wash stage didn't remove and that I'll need to further address. Overall, the paint was showing only very minor signs of hydrophobic behaviour, so any existing waxes or sealants were really on their last leg and just about gone. And I couldn't see any signs of traffic film or stubborn road grime, but I could feel just a light to moderate amount of environmental fallout that would need to be further removed. Now, paint decontamination usually falls into two categories, which are firstly chemical that relates to using iron and tar removers or even degreasers to chemically strip bonded contamination. And secondly, mechanical decontamination, which relates to using a clay bar and lubrication to physically remove them. Chemical decontamination is less aggressive in relation to marring the paint. And in many cases, when dealing with just light to moderate amounts of fallout, it can in fact completely remove it without the need to clay the paint. However, the method or technique that you use is very crucial to your success. Although spraying on an iron remover and letting it dwell will start to break down those tiny metal particles, it will rarely entirely remove them, even if they're just minimal. Using a microfiber cloth to wipe the chemical over and into the paint is what really allows you to effectively remove that environmental fallout. And the difference between just spraying and rinsing it off compared to working that chemical into the paint with a cloth makes all the difference. So after using the iron remover with this technique, not only was I able to remove all signs of those existing particles, but I also saw the water behavior further degraded, meaning that the paint was truly clean and bare and ready for the paint correction stage with no need or benefit whatsoever in claying the paint. Now you can certainly use blown or compressed air to dry the entire vehicle, but in many cases where the paint has next to no hydrophobic behaviour, using a drying towel will be a faster and more efficient method to tackle the main surface area of the car. But then using compressed air to blow out trapped water in panel trims and seams will still be necessary to ensure that the vehicle is completely dry and ready for masking the trims prior to the paint correction stage.
final stage of the vehicle cleanse or decontamination process is always an IPA or isopropyl alcohol wipe down. The reason for this is that no matter how well you rinse and dry the car, there'll always be chemical or detergent residue that lingers on the panels. And it will cause issues as it's picked up by your polishing pads and alters your paint correction results in a negative way. The benefit of an IPA wipe is that it will remove any remaining residue without leaving its own residue behind. And only after that final IPA panel wipe down is your paint and vehicle truly clean and bare and ready for the paint correction stage. Now just before we get to masking the vehicle, the owner wanted the rear Tesla badge removed. Generally, the newer the vehicle is, the easier it should be to remove the badge, as the backing tape or adhesive is still relatively fresh. But regardless of that, my method is still the same. You want to start by heating up the badge's adhesive with a heat gun, as that will soften and loosen its bond to the paint, making it both easier and safer to remove. You should generally use a mid-heat setting so you don't melt or damage the badge or the paint, and give it a few minutes to make its way from the surface of the badge to the backing tape. You can then either use some fishing line or some dental floss and run it behind the badge to separate it from the adhesive. Now, especially on older vehicles, I use a caramel wheel to remove the more stubborn tape residue. But on this newer vehicle, I was able to pick a large amount of it off just using my fingers, and then use a tar and adhesive remover to clean off all the rest. Next was masking the vehicle's trims and certain panel edges. Now as I've mentioned in past videos, masking trims isn't just about protecting them from damage or compound residue, but it's also about protecting your polishing pads from picking up unwanted plastic or rubber residue that can mar the paint's finish during the paint correction stage. And beyond that, you'll also see me masking certain panel edges to protect those more sensitive areas from burns or removing more clear coat than is necessary.
So onto measuring the paint's thickness. I have to say that in all the years that I've been measuring automotive paint, I've never seen such a discrepancy of paint thickness readings on a brand new car. Now if this was an older vehicle, having been aggressively compounded in the past, or been unprotected and exposed to a lot of UV light, it would certainly be nothing out of the ordinary. But for a brand new car to have paint thickness readings as high as 170 microns and as low as 80 microns is a crazy variance that triggers a lot of alarm bells and immediately increases my risk of working on the paint. But what was even more disturbing was the fact that the readings detailers take in car door jams is usually used as a reference point of the bare minimum amount of clear coat that a vehicle contains. And this was the first time ever I've seen lower paint thickness readings on the exterior panels of a car compared to the door jams which is just an extremely bad sign. So there's really only two possible reasons why this brand new car could possibly have such inconsistent and dangerously low paint thickness levels. Which is firstly that the way the car's paint was laid down or applied is in a subpar manner and more reminiscent of a cheap low budget paint job rather than an OEM car manufacturing standard. And the other reason is that either the car manufacturer or the car dealership absolutely went to town on this car with some seriously aggressive sanding and or compounding, removing excessive amounts of clear coat in certain areas. Or it could potentially be both scenarios. In any case, I definitely wouldn't be happy about this if this was my brand new car. Now I realize that it may be difficult to properly see in the footage as metallic paints tend to blow out on camera. But there was a definite hazed and slightly patchy finish in the paint that once again I wouldn't think twice if it was an older vehicle. But on a brand new car it's just not what I'd expect or accept from any car manufacturer. Though to be fair I have seen similar finishes on new cars before. Now it's not like it's overly bad or a horrible finish or that it's all scratched up in an obvious way. But for someone with an eye for detail, it's quite apparent that it's well below an OEM standard and just doesn't pop like a new car or paint should and just looks a little dull and muted. And when we have a look at the piano black plastics, they actually are really scratched up. And I know it's not from the owner as I asked him not to wash the vehicle before the detail, which he agreed to. Apart from that, there's some definite rotary buffer holograms in certain random areas. And later on, during the paint correction process, I also spotted quite a few dust nibs throughout the vehicle and a couple of strange, discolored, tiny spots that look like little concentrated clumps of metallic flakes. And lastly, it's absolutely normal for a car's painted plastic bumpers to be half a shade or two off in matching the rest of the car. But I have to say that the front bumper of this car was about two shades lighter than the rest of the car and really quite obviously not a great colour match at all. No new car is ever perfect and I've definitely detailed my share of swirled up and badly delivered new cars. But it seems to me like the quality control of the paint job itself on this car is the real issue. But since this is the first Tesla I've ever detailed, I can't really say whether this is a one-off or a common issue with their paint jobs. So onto the paint correction stage. 
Now based on my paint thickness readings, I was really hoping that a very light polish and a gentle polishing pad combination would be enough to bring some more life into this paint. But based on my inspection of the paint, I honestly had my doubts whether it would be enough. So starting with the least aggressive combination, my first test was using the Ripper's LHR15 polisher with Shine Supply Classic Finish, which is a super fine polish on the Lake Country HDO Foam Orange Pad, which is quite a non-aggressive polishing pad. As far as technique goes, I'm starting with about 3-4 to four drops of polish on a fresh pad, spreading it into an area about 6 times the size of the pad, and using a mid to high machine speed with a slow arm movement and just moderate pressure, completing 3-4 to four row passes of my machine in the test section. I should also add that for this car and for most new cars I ceramic coat, I've quoted and budgeted both my time and cost for doing what's known as an enhancement polish, which is based around addressing very light swirls and boosting gloss levels, as well as promoting a far better bond with the ceramic coating to the paint. So unlike more time consuming and costly paint correction services that I usually provide for second hand cars that require a lot more work such as a light correction to a more full in-depth paint restoration, a paint enhancement is a far quicker and less expensive process. After having a look at the results in this first test section, it's definitely not as I'd hoped, but more as I'd guessed. Classic Finish did to some extent address some of the super light swirls, but it just didn't have enough bite or cutting power to remove most of them or help improve the hazed or cloudy finish in the paint. In fact, I could even see a slight increase in fine haze that this combination had left on the paint. I've actually had some fantastic results using Shine Supply polishes and compounds in the recent past. But to be honest, I've still yet to have any success with classic finish that really seems more like a specialty polish that needs that specific type of paint, pad and technique to achieve success. So in this case, both the cutting and finishing qualities of this combination just weren't great on this paint type. For my second combination, I stuck with the same Lake Country Orange HDO pad, but this time stepped up to Shine Supply Classic Polish, which is more of a standard fine polish rather than a super fine and more specialised one, and I also pretty much kept my method and technique the same. Now in complete contrast to the first section, I could definitely see a more obvious level of improved defect removal that was able to eliminate the majority of the fine swirls and actually also further refine that cloudiness in the paint while the finish showed signs of boosted gloss and clarity. However, although it was a more obvious step in the right direction, I could still see a percentage of lighter swirls it just didn't remove. And based on my past experience, I still felt like the paint had more gloss and clarity to unlock with the right combination. So seeing the classic polish was finishing extremely well on this paint, but was just lacking a little in cut, I decided to try it on the Lake Country Blue HDO foam pad to see if I could retain its fantastic finish, but just slightly increase its cutting ability. Now I realise it's difficult to clearly see it in the footage, but this combination worked extremely well, addressing almost all the existing fine scratches, but even more so important, the clarity and gloss levels of the paint were just so much better, 
as the paint took on a slightly darker and more saturated finish and the reflection of the paint became so much sharper as the existing layer of haze and cloudiness was all but removed. Now in truth, if I hadn't measured such inconsistent and low paint thickness readings, I would have further investigated if a slightly more capable medium cutting compound would address even more of the existing defects and bring out even more clarity in the finish. But as it stands, with such low paint thickness readings in certain areas, it's not always about chasing that 100% defect removal and gloss. It's also about being respectful to the car and trying to maintain as much clear coat as possible. But in saying that, I still know that the paint will look absolutely amazing by the time I'm done and much, much better than how it was originally presented to the customer. So with my combination of pad, polish and technique sorted, it was time to get down to business and make this paint truly shine. Generally, I like to start with my smaller 3 inch polisher to do my edge work, which is always the most time consuming part of paint correction. And it's doubly important on a car like this with some low paint thickness readings to avoid using larger and more aggressive 5 and 6 inch pads on your panel edges, as it becomes a much riskier proposition even with me using quite a non-aggressive combination of polish and pad. But apart from the risk of burning through the paint, I'm also able to achieve much better levels of paint correction using smaller polishes and pads for edge work. Now part of every job is always constantly assessing my progress and results. And as I continued to polish the bonnet, I found that the amount of cut or defect removal I was achieving was less than I'd like and was taking far longer than I expected to achieve the desired results. Now seeing that I really didn't want to use a substantially more aggressive combination for the reasons that I've already explained, I decided to test out a cocktail mix of using two parts of my existing polish mixed with one part of just a slightly more capable cutting compound in the form of classic cut. And after a little testing and further assessing the results, it worked absolutely perfectly, giving me just that extra touch of cut that I was searching for, but without compromising the fantastic finishing results. A couple of things that I should mention about this particular car and job is firstly that I was definitely running way behind time. 
As I mentioned earlier, this car was really booked in for a new car cleanse, enhancement polish and coating. But due to the finish of the existing paint, a quicker and more basic enhancement polish just wasn't going to achieve a finish that I was happy with or that this car and owner deserved. So to achieve the results that I ultimately obtained in the end took a lot more time and work than I originally estimated. Secondly, being the first Tesla I've ever detailed was a bit of a learning curve. I was actually initially being locked out of accessing certain parts of the car, such as opening the front bonnet, which was due to the owner having the car in valet mode. Now, I understand that now, but it honestly set me back wasting time researching and trying to figure out why I couldn't access certain things that I needed to in order to do my job. And I have to say that although I have nothing to hide, and I completely understand Tesla owners wanting to protect their investment, I just didn't appreciate seeing all the cameras on the car constantly flashing red in recording mode, especially in my own private shop, which honestly felt a little like it was crossing a line. But in any case, this job ended up taking almost twice as long as it should. And as such, I really had to focus more on completing the job rather than trying to make this video. So, although there are certain parts of this job and areas of the car, such as polishing all the glass roof, windshield and side mirrors in preparation for the coating, and also correcting the rear of the vehicle, where I just had to put the camera down and focus on the job at hand. The entire vehicle was basically polished from head to toe using this same combination. Some of the piano black plastic trims did require a two-stage process, and as I progressed from section to section, there was definitely a few areas that popped up having a lot more swirls and scratches than I initially spotted. All of which, once again, did require quite a bit more time and effort to correct. My general estimation for time on this job as a new car ceramic coating package was approximately 20 hours work, which is give or take how long this basic package usually takes to complete on most cars. But as it stands, in the end, I was well over 30 hours into this job, and it took quite a bit of overtime to make up and recover those extra hours. However, I can definitely say that I'm a lot more informed now as to what to expect from a Tesla, and how to manage its more particular challenges. So, even for as long as I've been detailing cars, it's still great to constantly be able to learn and evolve as the technology of car changes and presents new challenges.
Now as far as coating the vehicle, Nova Glass coating was used for the front windscreen and door windows as standard paint coatings tend to prematurely diminish by wiper blades and the rubber seals on door glass as the windows go up and down. But as for the roof and rear glass that has no movement or wipers, I still find that a paint coating tends to last longer and perform better on those glass panels. And as I mentioned earlier, I also gave the wheel covers a coat of NovaJet spray coating to help protect and maintain them. Now it was actually quite a seriously hot spring day when I was coating the car. And being the Nova Pro is quite a quick flashing coating, I stuck to applying it to just one section at a time. And as the temperature throughout the day continued to rise, I actually had to start working even smaller sections to combat the ambient and changing climate. Now just like in the paint correction stage, I was still well behind in completing this job as I moved onto the coating stage. So I actually coated all the glass, wheels and dressed the tyres the night before. And after getting some general coating footage for this video, I had to once again put my cameras away and really focus on completing this job so that the coating would have enough time to cure and it would be all ready for the owner to pick up by the end of the day. Although this job did present a few logistical issues, and it did end up taking a lot more time and effort than I first thought, I have to say that in the end, I was even surprised myself as to just how amazing the paint really turned out after all the paint correction work and the coatings were all finally applied. The paint was definitely more of a neutral grey shade when I first started working on it, but by the end, all those metallic flakes were allowed to properly shine and catch the light so the car ended up looking like more of a rich purple rather than a dull grey. And I can also tell you that the owner, who I'm sure will be watching this video, was also really ecstatic and grateful for the finished results. As always, I really hope you guys enjoyed and found this video useful. Please like, comment and subscribe to this channel to show your support for these videos and I'll see you guys soon.
took your punches I played the game You promised me that I would never be alone 